you know, you can be very creative when you've got parameters. When someone says, okay, play whatever you want, it's hard to think of something. When someone says, play something that's in 16s and it's got some holes in it, then you think, okay, well, he still hasn't told me what to play, but I've already got some ideas. And you've got, it's easy to be kind of more creative in tight parameters. If someone says, improvise a drum solo, only the snare drum and one floor tom, I could really get into that, right? If they just say, play a drum solo for half an hour and use everything, it's too much choice. You get swamped with choice. It's like, you know, you buy a keyboard, it's got 2,000 sounds on it. I can't listen to 2,000 sounds. I've lost the inspiration to, well, I've lost the will to live by about <laughs> sound 200. Now, I'll show you this thing that I call curling, right? It's just a name I gave to a certain type of fill-in. And usually it's coming up the drums, and usually there's, I play crashes along the way, usually on the second part of a bass drum. So I'll play you some examples of this kind of fill concept that I call curling, right? idea. Now, so when, I, when I'm thinking about a fill, you know, maybe we've got, we're playing a ballad, and I think, oh, I know, I'll do one of these kind of curling. I haven't worked out exactly what I'm going to play, but I've worked out what kind of thing I'm going to play, right? So maybe we're playing a ballad. You know what I mean? I don't know what I'm going to do, but I've got a, a clue about the shape. Now, if we're playing a certain tempo or a certain intensity, you know, I'm not going to do this in the middle of a ballad. You know what I mean? It kind of feels, it feels wrong for the song. It depends. I mean, maybe there's a really hard section coming up. Uh, it, it makes you question the whole, what's the point of a fill-in? What is the point? When I was playing in King Crimson, Robert Fripp said to me, if you feel the need, <laughs> if you feel the need to play a fill, you don't have to play it on bar 16 or bar 8. You don't have to keep hitting a 1. I know where the 1 is. You know, you're playing conductor on me. It's like, here comes the chorus. Bosh. You know, you say, I, I know where the one is. You don't have to make it so obvious, you know. But when you listen to it, when you grow up listening to pop music, there's a fill before the chorus, there's a fill before the verse. And you kind of think, well, what are you really trying to say with it? Is it just like a nervous habit where you just go, stop, da, 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 bum, oomph? You know what I mean? And I started looking at a lot of details at what I do, especially the really tiny details and, and question why you would do them. And really, when I'm listening to a song and I'm listening to the vocals, I'm looking for spaces. I don't want to play a fill completely over the vocal, because the vocal is the, the center kind of point of interest, the center sort of attraction of the, of the piece. So I'm looking for holes in the vocal line where I might just do something very small. You know, I might... Something like that, or just even a couple of ghost notes. I wouldn't do it exactly when there's a vocal line. I would look for little holes to just do very sly things. You know, and some of these kind of sounds I've got are suitable for doing little, subtle, little subtleties. Um, I'm changing that all the time. That's completely liquid. You know, when I'm playing a, a gig, all these kind of little embellishments, kind of musical subtle embellishments are happening all the time in a different place. You know, I, I remember we used to play a song some ballad song, and there was like 16s on the ride. And 
And then one day I just decided it would be nice to play eights on the ride and suggest the sixteenths on, on the snare drum. Just kind of sounded cooler to me than having that dip, 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 dip. There's, a, um, there's another song I can't remember where we just play quarter notes on the ride. And it just kind of means more to the song to just play, you know. It's actually a lot harder to play like that. But when I listen to it and really listen to the song as a whole, kind of as a, as a listener, as a producer, and not as a drummer. You know, sometimes when you think as a drummer, you're just looking for opportunities to play licks and score points. You know, you want to, I don't know, you just want to make yourself look good. And sometimes the way to make yourself look good is by doing really sort of subtle things. And the other guys in the band love that. It's only the drummers in the audience who notice when you, you sort of do a, you know, kind of couple of flash things. The guys in the band don't care about that. They really don't care about that. They care when, when the vibe's right. They care when the atmosphere's right. They really care when the tempo's good. And they really care when you're listening. You know, they might play something. Steve might play a triplet on his guitar solo. You know. And just that little thing is suddenly, oh, that's great. That's, you know, that's for me, is, is, is a nicer detail than, than a great big run down the toms. You know, it shows that you're listening. And I know when I started playing bass, I play a little bit of bass, and I started playing along with drummer friends of mine. Boy, that was a real lesson. I started to realize, if I was a bass player, now I know what I want a drummer to do. And all I want him to do is just play in time. <laughs> 